Good morning. Today's reading is written in the 15th chapter of Luke. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he was wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and a man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And now verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Word of God, word of life. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of God. Alleluia. Please be seated. Uh, if you're just joining us online, welcome into worship. Glad that you are here. We started last week on a three-week journey in which we are looking at this parable called the prodigal son that we find in the 15th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. Last week we got kind of a 17,000 feet above the ground look at this um, parable that Jesus teaches. Now, today I want us to look carefully at the two brothers in this story, the two sons in this story, because I think a better title for this parable is the parable of the two lost sons, because it literally has a focus on these two. In Act 1, you kind of have you and see the lostness of the younger brother, but then in Act 2, you see the older brother, and you also see a type of lostness because Jesus in this parable is trying to get at that there are two ways that we as followers can be lost now the reason he does this is because there's literally two groups of people that are listening to this parable as he is uh, saying it all right there are the tax collectors and what Luke calls the other notorious sinners on one side right they're the ones who've left the tradition. They're the ones who have run far away. They don't follow any of the religious laws or anything like that. And for a lot of people, they're like, yeah, they're, they're lost. They're the ones who are lost, right? And so you have this group of people over here, and this group of people obviously identifies and corresponds with the younger brother, right, who runs off and who squanders everything that he has. But Jesus also has in the crowd with him the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, 
All right? They're sitting there listening to this as well. And Jesus is talking to them, even though they don't realize it. All right? And, and, and the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, they're going to correspond with the elder brother. They're the ones who kept the traditions. They're the ones who did what was right. They're the ones who uh, uh, upheld all of the moral and, and religious laws of the time. And Jesus is talking to both of the crowds. It's to these two groups of people that Jesus is speaking to. And Jesus, in this parable, actually shows us that there are two ways, all right, that both of these brothers are alienated from the Father. There are two ways that we can alienate ourselves from God. And both of these brothers, they want what the Father can give them, right? They want the Father's things. They want what the Father can offer them. The status, the wealth. But neither of these two brothers really want the Father's heart. And he shows that there are two types of lostness in this world. And he shows us that there are two basic ways that people try to find happiness and they try to find fulfillment in their lives. On the one hand, you have moral conformity. And the other way is through self-discovery. And each way has its own lens of how you see and how you view the world. Each way has its own way of finding significance and worth. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the younger brother is the one who a lot of people always identify with in the story. Right? I think because a lot of us, we've probably gone that route before. Right? We've lost our way. We've just run off, and we're finding our way back to God. Right? And not only that, but I think we, we do identify with the younger brother because we can actually see the sin, right? We can point it out and we can go, yep, there it is, that sin. And in ancient patriarchal cultures, a lot of people took this route of self-discovery. But I think there are far more who take this route today. And some of us have no doubt followed this path a lot of us probably know people who follow this path. And this paradigm holds that individuals must be free to pursue their own goals, to pursue their own self-actualization, regardless of what custom and convention and, and, and moral laws say about it. And in this view, the world will be a far better place if tradition and if prejudice and if hierarchical authority and other barriers to personal freedom were just weakened or just removed altogether. But you also have the path and you have the view of the elder brother. And that's the way of moral conformity. Right? The Pharisees of Jesus' day believed that while they were the chosen people by God, that you could only maintain that presence, that you can only maintain God's favor, that you can only maintain God's blessing, that you could only receive final salvation through strict obedience to the law, right? Through the scripture. And in this view, we only attain happiness and the world is only made right by achieving moral rectitude. Yeah, sure, we may fall at some times. Of course we will. But then we will be judged by how abject and intense our regret really is and how we try to earn our way back in. And in this view, what happens is this, that even in our failures, we always have to measure up. And I don't know about you, but that can get very tiring. Remember the elder brother's words. All these years I have obeyed you. Right? I've done exactly what you said. Everything you told me to do. And at one time did you ever throw a party like this for me? And, 
And, and, and the person of moral conformity says, I'm not going to do what I want, but I'm going to do what you say I want. I'm going to do what tradition says to do and the community says to do. And I'm going to try to follow it by the law until what happens? Until we don't get what we want. And then we say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, God. I have followed this to the T. I've gone to church. I've been a good person. I've tithed everything that I have back to the church and out into the community. I've helped my neighbors in need. So why all of a sudden am I not getting what I asked for? And then you have the person of self-discovery who says, look, I'm the only one who can decide what is right for me. I'm going to live as I want to live, and I'm going to find my true self, and I'm going to try to find my true happiness, and forget all of the religious law and authority. I'm going to do this on my own. And, and, and here's the deal. You don't need a PhD in sociology to see that our Western society is so deeply divided between these two approaches. So much so that hardly anyone can recognize another way to live. And what happens is, is that in the end, you get moral conformists saying, well, it's the immoral people. They're the problem, right? The people who are doing their own thing, the people who aren't following how they're supposed to, to the things that they're supposed to follow. They're what's wrong with the world. They're the problem. And we who have all of the truth and answers, us moral people, we are the solution to the problem. And then you have the people on the other side saying, no, 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 no. It's the bigoted, hypocritical people, the people who say that they have the truth, the people who say that they're, they have all of the morality in the world. They're the ones who are with the problem with the world. And the progressive people, we're the solutions to the problem. And here's what happens. You get both sides saying, our way is the way the world will be put right. And if you aren't with us, then you're against us. Sound familiar? And so, given that then, are we then to conclude that everyone then falls within one of these two ways of living? Well, the answer is clear. Yes and no. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry, I, if, you, if you're looking for something more, more grand and grandiose, that's all I got. Yes and no. Because here's the deal. Some of us, we do live our lives in one place or the other. But I think a whole bunch of us go back and forth based on where we, at, where we are at in the season of our life. Okay, let's, let's just face it. When we're younger, we're probably going the way of the younger brother. Right? Forget the moral conformists. Forget tradition. Forget all of that. I'm going to try to find my way on my own then as we get older and older, we suddenly gravitate towards the elder brother approach to the style. And it's like, no, you can't do it that way. You've got to stick to this. This is the way that we have to be. And some of us ebb and flow really easily back and forth, back and forth. Some of us even try one thing, even if we're in another camp, oh, we'll just try it for another time. And then all of a sudden something comes up and we go back to the other camp. And then some of us, we just try to put them together, <laughs> right? We, we look like elder brothers on the outside during the day, and then at night we're the younger brothers, hoping no one will find out. And this is what is so radical about the message in Jesus' parable. What is Jesus' parable teaching us? That both are wrong. That if you, if you gravitate to one pole or the other, you have the tendency, you will have the time and the place to alienate yourself from the Father. Both methods will have you wanting what the Father can give you, 
but not the Father's heart. So Jesus offers us this totally radical alternative. If you look closely here, you will see that both brothers' hearts and the two ways of life that they represent are really more alike than they first appear. You know, on the outside, it's like, oh, well, you know, you got one who goes off and does whatever he wants to, and you got another one that is doing whatever is right. But if you look at their intentions... They're really not too different. Their hearts are the same. Because both of them want to try to gain control of the Father in their own different ways. To try to get what they feel that they deserve. Or have earned. Both of these individuals resented their father's authority. One just takes his share and insults the father, basically tells him he's dead, and runs off and squanders it. And the other one refuses to be a part of the family and refuses to go in because he didn't get what he thought he deserved, and he doesn't want to be a part of the family as long as his younger brother's in it. And while his brother was far away, he never disobeyed. But he did so not out of love for who the father was, but for what he could get from the father in the end. You can hear it in his words. Wait a minute. I followed everything. You never gave me anything. Right there it is. Each of them wanted to get into a position in which they could tell the father what to do. Each rebelled in their own way. One did it by being very good, and the other one did it by being very bad. And both ended up alienating themselves from their father. And Jesus says, and Jesus shows us, that in both of these individuals... Both are lost. Do you realize what Jesus is teaching in this? This is what I want you to get. Timothy Keller points out, he says, neither of these sons loved the father for himself. All right? That they were both using the father for their own self-centered interests and their own self-centered ends to their means rather than loving and enjoying and serving their dad for his sake. That's a shocking message. That careful obedience to God's law may serve as a strategy in the end for rebelling against God. Guys, that's a deeper concept of sin than what we are used to, right? What do most of us think about when we think about sin? We think about bad stuff, right? (laughs) Yeah, we think about bad stuff. We think about, you know, the things that we do that fail to keep God's rules or the, the, the things that we fail to do to keep God's way of conduct, right, and of hurting people and all, all of these other sorts of things, But Jesus' definition of sin goes far beyond that. It actually goes deeper. He said, look, you can avoid me as a savior by keeping all the moral laws that somehow gives you the rights to answered prayers and a good life and a ticket to heaven. But in that case... You don't need a savior. You're acting as your own savior. That's clearly the attitude of the elder brother. Why is he so angry with the father? Because he feels that after keeping all the laws, after keeping everything that the father has taught him to do, 
By being a moral and upright and outstanding young man, he feels he has the right to tell the father how the robe, the ring, and the fatted calf are to be dealt out. And I'm here to tell you that that message is still pervasive in Christianity today. Who gets in and who doesn't? Who has rights at the table and who doesn't? If this is the way that we then live our lives, then Jesus may be our helper, Jesus may be our example, Jesus may be even our inspiration. But in those moments, Jesus fails to be a savior. There are two ways to be your savior. Break the rules, do it on your own, or keep all the laws, be very good, and decide how the robe, the ring, and the fatted calf are dealt out to everybody else. But that's not our job. That's the role of the father. And the father decides who's invited to the feast every day. And here's what the father's actions show us. That both of the sons may be lost. Both may be wrong. But both are loved. And both are welcome at the party. And that means that Jesus' message, which is the gospel, the gospel then isn't religion or irreligion. It isn't morality or immorality. It isn't moralism or relativism. It isn't conservatism or liberalism. Nor is it something halfway along the spectrum between the two poles. It means that the gospel is this. All of us are lost, all of us are loved, and all of us are invited into the feast. And the gospel challenges us to recognize the lostness in ourselves. It's called humility. Jesus says in Luke 18, the humble are in, the proud are out. And here's the deal. Humility is what makes us realize when we're in the pigsty of life that it's time for us to get up. Humility is the walk home. Humility is asking for forgiveness. Humility is realizing that we serve and that we do all the Father asks because of who the Father is, not for what we want out of it. And humility is about going in to the party, even when we object to who it's for. Look, the prerequisite for receiving grace is just knowing that you need it. And both the elder brother and the younger brother both need the grace of the Father, and both are given it. A newspaper posed the question in one of the editorial sections of the newspaper. The question was, what's wrong with the world? Great question. <laughs> a man by the name of J.K. Chesterton wrote a brief letter back to the editor that said, Dear sir, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> That's humility. That's realizing that you are lost, that you are a part of the problem. But it also, I think, shows that someone grasps the message of what Jesus is trying to teach us in this parable. Brothers and sisters, today, may you have the humility to see the lostness in yourself, to head on home, to receive the grace, and to be a part of the party. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and sing our next song.
will be mm-hmm.